Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so this week we're going to focus on on matchings, and specifically, so we're going to talk a little bit about matchings in general, but uh, the kind of main thing we're going to focus on is matching in bipartite graphs. So that's the topic this week. Okay. So first of all, let me give you a definition. So a matching in a graph G, so G is, so the vertex set is V, the edge set is P, is a subset M of the edge set such that every vertex, so every, ver every V in V, so every vertex little v in capital V, is contained in at most one edge in M. So, so it's a bunch of edges in your graph such that no vertex is an endpoint of more than one edge. So, so just to say this in another way, so, uh, so M is a set of edges, or a set of disjoint edges, right? So they don't have any shared endpoints. And another way to think of this is it's, so M is a kind of partial pairing of the vertices using, using edges. So let me, so I'll give you an example. Let's see if it's still here. Okay, right, so in this, so here, for example, so here we have a graph and the set of red edges here is a matching because it satisfies this condition. You know, if you look at, if you go through each vertex one by one, you see that each vertex is in, in at most one red edge, so it's a matching. This, but this set of red edges here, so this edge and these two, that's not a matching because you know this vertex happens to be in two red edges. So you can see it's you know matching is basically a way of pairing up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, it, it is a it is a valid use of the word disjoint. So I mean, okay. Th yeah, it's a valid word. So I, I didn't need to put the quotation right. So so if you think of you know these edges being not disjoint because they have an endpoint in common, right? Whereas these edges are disjoint. So if you think of an edge as being, you know, a, the kind of set containing its endpoints, right? These would be non-disjoint edges because they have an endpoint in common, whereas these are disjoint. Edges. Actually, let me bring this whiteboard down again because I need to, to write another definition. So, so another definition is a, a vertex cover. So a vertex cover in G is a set, a subset of the vertex set this time, such that every edge contains, um, so every edge of G, so every edge in E, contains at least one vertex of C. So in other words, so C, in other words, it, it, it's a, a set of vertices that hits every edge at least once. So back to the examples. <clears throat> so, so in this picture here, so the third picture, this set of red vertices would be a vertex cover because if you go through each edge one by one, you can see that each edge either has one red vertex, so it gets hit once, or some of them even have two red vertices. So, that, that, so this red set hits all the edges, whereas this is not a vertex cover because you can see that this edge, and in fact also this edge, they don't get hit by the red set. Any questions about these definitions? So here's a, a very basic fact. Oh, actually, let me give one more definition before I give that fact. So, well, yeah. So generally, what we're going to be interested in this week, well, what we're going to be interested in is finding the biggest matching in a graph, or sometimes we'll be interested in finding the smallest vertex cover. So, so it's useful to come up with some definition, some notation for that. So nu of g is the, the max size of a matching. So max cardinality of m, m is a matching in g. And like I said, we'll, we'll also be interested in the minimum size of a vertex cover. So tau of G is going to be minimum cardinality of C such that C is a vertex cover in G. So this is like, so, so a kind of you know, important, so two important combinatorial optimization problems. are you know, to compute nu of g or tau of g. Right? These are things that, that come up you know, in, a, in a lot of different applications. And I'll even mention just a few. If I remember, I'll mention a, a couple of simple applications of this 
you know, later in the lecture. But for now, just think of these as, as mathematical questions, you know, mathematical problems that, that we'd want to solve. We want to come up with algorithms, you know, efficient algorithms to, to compute these functions. So any questions about this far? Anything so far? Okay, so here's a, a basic lemma which connects these two quantities. So the lemma says that, in fact, you always have that nu of g is at most tau of g for every graph g. So, so, so if, you can, if you can compute one of these things, then at least you get a bound on the other one. Okay, and the proof of this is actually really pretty easy, right? So, so the proof of this is, so let m be a matching of size nu of g. So it's, it's a, a big, the biggest possible matching you can find in the graph. And let c be a vertex cover of size tau of g. So it's the smallest possible one. Well, OK, so remember, what are these definitions, right? So a vertex co cover is a set of vertices which hits all the edges. And a matching is a set of disjoint edges, right? So OK, so first of all, so c hits all the edges. So in particular, so since C is a vertex cover, you know, for every edge in M, so for every edge of the matching, there exists, so I'll call it, so for E and M, I'll call this guy VE. So there must be some element of the vertex cover uh, such that VE is an endpoint V. Right? So this vertex cover hits all the edges, so in particular, it hits every edge of M. But the, the edges in M are disjoint. Right, so therefore, so that implies that if you have two different edges, so if E and E prime are two different, you know, two dis distinct uh, edges in M, then they can't have the same kind of representative in the vertex cover, right? So then VE has to be different than VE prime because it, then if, it, if it wasn't, then they'd have an endpoint in common, right? And it's a matching. So this is because M is a matching. So last step is just kind of write this inequality. So so therefore, tau of g, which is equal to the size of c, so sorry, this is at least as large as, as this, right? Each of these is included in c, so this is at least as large as that. But that's exactly the size of m, because these are all distinct, and that's equal to nu of g. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. We want to prove this is at most. Any questions about that? OK, so generally speaking, so you have this inequality, nu is at most tau. But uh, you know, generally, these things can be you know, quite, quite far apart. Right, so, um, so one you know, very simple example, which shows that you know, these two quantities aren't the same. So, so just take, for example, any odd cycle. So take g to be, say, a cycle of length 5. So, so it's not hard to see that the biggest matching you can possibly take in here has size 2. Because if you take three edges, I mean, if you think about it, they're always going to, two of them are always going to have an endpoint in common, so this is two, whereas tau of g is three, so so they're not equal. Just to show you that you know this inequality holds, but it's not always equality. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to give you a bunch of definitions, and then we're going to prove something. So so we're going to focus more on vertex, co sorry, uh, more on matchings than vertex covers in the next few minutes. Okay. So okay. So let M be a matching in G, so a vertex B of G is we say that it's saturated by M if there exists an edge in M such that uh, V is an endpoint of E. Right, so this is just saying, you know, so matching is a set of disjoint edges. It you know, doesn't necessarily, it's not the case that every vertex is necessarily in one of those edges, and the saturated vertices are the ones that, that are hit by these edges. And Another definition. So, so, so one particularly interesting case of a matching is when all the vertices get saturated, right? So, so matching is said to be perfect. So, a perfect matching is one which saturates all the vertices. So, it's perfect if basically it pairs up all of the different. So, if if every vertex kind of gets a partner in the matching. Some more definitions. So again, M is a matching in G, and uh, so a path of V0, V1, say up to K in G is said to be M alternating. Basically, if the, if the edges alternate between being 
in the matching and not being in the match. So I'll, I'll draw a picture to show what I really mean in a second. So, so if the edges of the path alternate between being in the complement of M and in M. So what do I mean? So, so if you draw this path, so it's an alternating path. Okay, let's say let's say it only has length. So an alternating path, basically. So maybe so maybe the red edges are an M. So the first one, perhaps the first one's red. The first one's in the matching. The next one maybe. So so it's alternating if basically it goes back and forth, right? So so maybe the first one's an M. The next one isn't. The next one is. But it could it could also start with the first one not being an M. Or whatever whatever whatever. Another definition. So this is this is kind of this is the, the kind of crucial definition. So an M, if you have an M alternating path, so let's say the path is V zero again up to V K, we say that it's M augmenting if V uh, zero and V K, so the the endpoints of the path are not saturated by M. So what's the point of this definition? Right? So well so the point of this definition is that whenever you have if you can find an M augmenting path, then, well, remember, what, what we're interested in is you know, finding the biggest matching. Right? We want to find big matching. And the point of this is that if you can find an augmenting path, you can make the matching bigger. Why? Well, so, so for example, suppose, you know, consider just, just a simple example. Suppose this is our graph. So if, I, if this is my matching M, then so, so if I look at this path, so this is an augmenting path, right? Because it alternates, it goes, you know, not in M, in M, you know, et cetera. And the endpoints are not saturated because they're, they're not touching any red edges. So if, if that was ever the case, then what I can do, well, sorry, this picture is not really very good, but what I can do is I can flip. So I can, if I look at this path, I can flip the red edges to black and the black edges to red. So, so this one was black before, V0 to V1, now it becomes red. This one gets flipped to red. That one's now black. This one's red. And now I've gone from a matching of size 2 to matching of size 3. So, so augmenting paths allow you to boost the size of your matching. And if you want to find a big matching, then that's quite useful. Now, what you might be thinking is like, OK, this is one way to boost the size of the matching, but maybe there are other ways. But that turns out to not be the case. So it turns out that actually, in some sense, this is the, uh, the kind of, you know, if you, can, if, you, if you can find a bigger matching, you can always find a bigger matching using, by using an augmenting path. Any questions at the moment? So this is a theorem of Burge from 1957. So it says that a matching M in G has maximum size if and only if there does not exist an M augmenting path. So, so, it, so it turns out like if you want to say is this matching maximum or not, it, it all comes down to saying is there an M, M augmenting path or not. Although it's, if you think about it, it's not so easy to find an M augmenting, augmenting path. But uh, okay, so so one direction is easy, right? So if there is not, if there exists an M augmenting path. Right, so it's some path where the endpoints are not saturated and it switches between M and the complement of M. So switch the edges on the path and get a larger matching. So meaning, go along that path, every edge which was not in the matching, you put it into the matching, and every edge that was in the matching, you take it out. So is it clear why this why this works? So note it was important that the endpoints originally they weren't saturated, right? Because for example, when I you know the first edge along this path won't cause any problems. So this will this will stay a matching. So this gives it yeah. Well, so if, so if it's not clear why this gives a matching, then well, so any questions about that? Is it is it clear? Right. So when I say switch, that means things you know if you think of your matching as being red edges. 
The things that weren't red, you make them red. The things that are red, you make them not red. OK, so conversely, so for the other direction, suppose you have a matching. So suppose m is not maximum size. So it's, it's a matching, but it doesn't have the biggest size. And let m prime be a bigger matching. So the size of m prime is strictly bigger than the size of m. Of course, if m doesn't have the biggest, it's not a maximum matching, then of course there's a bigger one. Right? That's OK, so now what we're going to do is define a, uh, a graph. So let, let h be a graph. Right? By, by, by the way, I mean, our, our whole goal here is now to find, what we want to do is we find, want to find an augmenting path. So here's the trick. So let h be a graph with vertex set. So it's the same vertex set as g. So you just keep all the vertices. And the edge set, which is the symmetric difference of m and m prime. Okay, so I'm not sure if everyone knows this notation. So, so generally, if you have two sets, x and y, so the symmetric difference is defined to be the things which are in y, sorry, x but not y, union y not x. So if you kind of think of the Venn diagram, right? So if you have two sets, x and y, the symmetric difference is all of this stuff. It's all the stuff that's in x and not y, and the stuff that's in y, not x. So you can also write this as, so in other words, it's the union of x and y minus their intersection. So that's equivalent. Have people seen this notation before, symmetric difference? If not, it's, it doesn't, it's not really a big deal. But right, so anyway, h has, uh, so you take a graph that has all the vertices, and it has the edges which happen to be in m, and not in m prime, union the edges that are in m prime, not in m. Okay. Okay. So this is a kind of simple looking graph, right? Because remember, a matching, you know, matching only hits any given vertex once once, right? So note every vertex in H has degree. So maybe I'm not sure whether I define this, so let me tell you what it is in a second. But uh, so the degree is at most 2 in H. So degree of a vertex, so degree of a vertex V is the number of edges containing it. So in H, the, 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 you know, the, all the degrees are at most 2, right? Because you can only have at most one edge coming from M and at most one from M prime. OK, and also, OK, so, so when you have a graph, so it's not hard to, to see that if you, so if you think of a graph where the degrees are at most 2, well, Actually, if you just think of, if you think of this graph H, so it's not hard to see that uh, so every component, so when I say component, I mean you know, connected subgraph, or connect, yeah, maximally connected subgraph. Every component of H is either, so it either has to look like this, so it's a, an even cycle, perhaps, where the, OK, so let's say that the uh, red edges are, are from M, and the green edges are from M prime. So one possibility is that you have a, one of your component, you know, your components can be a cycle where the edges alternate back and forth between red and green. So this is a, an even cycle with edges alternating between, well, technically m minus m prime and, and m prime minus m. So that's one possibility. And the other possibility is that it could be a path, so, or a path with alternating edges. So, so you could also have something like this. So, so far we haven't used the fact that m prime is bigger than m. So that's what we're going to do now. But any questions about this, this thing about h? OK, so he, here's the kicker that, you know, so remember that the size of m prime is bigger than the size of m. And if you think about it, that, that's the same as saying that, it's in fact equivalent to saying that m prime minus m is bigger than m minus m prime. Because basically, you know, on both sides, I just kind of delete the intersection between the two sets. And so, so this must be the case. So therefore, there must exist a component of H with more edges in m prime minus m than in m minus m prime. Because right? if, every, if every component had more edges of this type than this type, then overall you'd have more edges of this type than, or at least as many of this type as this type. Right? So the sum which has more, have more of these, so what does that look like? So this component must be a path, right? because we know that whenever you have a cycle, it alternates between the two, so you have the same number of both. So it looks like this. So remember, m prime is green. So it's a path that starts green, red, green, and 
at the end, it ends with green. That's the only possibility where you can have more m prime than m. And OK, so I, I call this guy v, so v, v0, v1, up to vk. And now, so I claim that this is going to be my, my augmenting path. So, so this is going to be, aug it's augmenting if, uh, so definitely, so this is, by the way, remember, this is something in m prime not m. So therefore, this is, a, in particular, it's an e minus m, right? So this, this is a path which alternates between e minus m, m, e minus m, m, et cetera. And the only thing I have to check is that v0 is not saturated. So, and vk would, you know, the proof is the same for vk, that v0 is not saturated by m. So if it was, well, remember, this is a component of h. So if it was saturated by m, there'd be some edge of m, so incident to, to v0, but that edge doesn't show up in h. So, so, so the reason, so, uh, right, so if, so, okay, so there doesn't exist um, an edge of m minus m incident or containing to v0 because, because this is simply a component of h. So if there was one, it would have to be in, in you know, m intersect m prime. So if some is incident to, to v0, then it is in m intersect m prime. But then what would happen is, well, I mean, he's already got some, so basically there'd be some kind of edge like this, but then that contradicts the fact that m prime was a matching. So, so that means that v0 is incident to two edges of m prime. That's a contradiction. And that concludes the proof. So two edges of m prime, one which happens to be in m minus m prime, and one which is in m prime intersect m. OK, so there, therefore this is an augmenting path, and that completes the proof. Okay. Any questions about that proof? Maybe the last bit. I'm not sure. It was potentially a little bit fast. Well, that's kind of nice, right? Because it kind of says that you know, if we want to find a big matching, it's the same thing as finding an augmenting path. So there's sort of only one way to increase the matching. Or, yeah, not that there's only one way, but every way of doing it. I mean, you may as well just find an augmenting path. So, so I start out off saying that this week we're going to talk about matchings in bipartite graphs, but I haven't told you anything about bipartite graphs yet. So this is where, so so far everything has been about general graphs, but now we'll think, we'll, we'll turn our attention to bipartite graphs. So I'll tell you what those are. A graph G is bipartite if there exists a partitioning of the vertex set. So G is the graph VE, as usual, into sets A and B such that every edge of G has one endpoint in A and one endpoint in B. So it has one end in, in A and one in B. So partitioning, of course, I mean, you know, when I say partitioning, I mean that the union is the whole vertex set and they're disjoint. All right, so it's a way of splitting the vertices such that all the edges go across. So for example, I mean, it's easy to come up with an example. I just draw two sets, A and B, put down some vertices, right, and draw some edges across. So this is an example of a bipartite graph, is all the edges go from this side to that side. Now, why would we care about matching in bipartite graphs? Well, it turns out there's like a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of natural problems here, right? Real world problems, which can be phrased as matching in bipartite graphs, right? So for example, so, you know, if you have some kind of problem where you have workers, so kind of a, an application, and you have jobs, right? So, so represent each worker by a vertex on this side, each job by a vertex on this side. And you can join the workers, a worker to a job, if this is, uh, so, so w this means that worker X is qualified for job Y, right? Right, so you can, you can draw some sort of some sort of graph like this, right? Maybe this guy's not qualified. Maybe this guy's not qualified for anything, right? And if you find a matching in this graph, that gives a way of assigning workers to jobs where everybody's qualified for the job that they get assigned to, right? So matching is a job assignment. Okay, so so I just want to state one theorem and then we'll be done. And this is something we'll start we'll start tomorrow's class or yeah tomorrow's lecture by proving this theorem. 
right, so, so this is something called Koenig's theorem. So remember, so now remember back to when we were talking about vertex covers, we said that the biggest matching is always at most as large as the smallest vertex cover. And Koenig's theorem from 1931, apparently, says that if G is bipartite, then you get that the size of the biggest matching is equal to the size of the smallest vertex cover. Okay, so remember, we already know this inequality for all G, right? And I gave you an example showing these aren't, you know, they're not necessarily always the same, but if your graph is bipartite, then they are the same. So we'll start next day by proving that. Uh, okay, that's, that's all for today. Thank you.